Welcome to What Catholics Believe. I'm your host, Julius Smithona. Perhaps many of you have occasionally read in the newspapers about traditionalist priests, Catholic priests who appear to completely disobey the hierarchy. They say the Latin Mass, which many say has been forbidden. They go into dioceses they are not part of and set up mass centers. They reject Vatican II. They seem to have contempt for the authority of the Pope, the authority of the bishops, and yet they claim to be following the spirit of Christ. Well, with us today is exactly such a priest, a priest who is called a traditionalist priest by the news media, but who would more accurately perhaps describe himself simply as a Catholic priest, faithful to tradition. With me today is the Reverend Clarence Kelly. Father Kelly, welcome to our show. It's a pleasure to be here, Julius. Father, how did you come to oppose the whole weight of the apparent magisterium and refuse the reforms of Vatican II, which the popes say are obligatory, and go on your own way and, in a sense, decide what is the Catholic faith? Uh, I think that your characterization is a little bit harsh. All right. uh, the use of the word, for example, contempt or opposition to the magisterium of the church, uh, those are really not adequate uh, in the sense that uh, they do not express what we're doing. There is no contempt whatsoever for uh, any authority in what we do. And secondly, what we do is not opposed to the magisterium of the church. It is rather opposed to certain disciplinary directives of the hierarchy of the church. The magisterium of the church refers to the teaching office of the church. When the church teaches this is true, this doctrine has been revealed by Christ and we must believe it. That's the, the magisterial office or the teaching office. The changes that have been introduced into the church since the Second Vatican Council have not been introduced as solemn teaching. So uh, our opposition, my opposition, and uh, the opposition of other priests to do what I do is not an opposition to the magisterium. It's rather an opposition to actions which are irreconcilable with teachings of the magisterium. Father Kelly, let me ask you a strong question. If a Catholic layperson comes to you, how does he even know you're a priest? Uh, does the hierarchy of the apparent Catholic Church recognize that you're a Roman Catholic priest or not? How do they look upon you? They recognize uh, that I am a Roman Catholic priest. I was ordained by a traditional Catholic bishop, and there is no question in their mind about the fact that I am a Catholic priest. Hmm. What is your background? How did you come to take the position you have taken? Uh, where did you go to seminary, say? Well, I, uh, I joined uh, the service when I was 17. The Air Force? The Air Force oh. in 1959. And I was in for just under four years. And when I got out of the service, I had a, a little bit more of a serious disposition than I had when I went in. It was a good experience for me. And uh, sometime after I got out, within a year or so, I began to think about the possibility of becoming a priest. And so in 1964, I entered a seminary in uh, Pennsylvania, a Franciscan seminary run by the fathers, uh, third order regular Franciscan fathers. And uh, I was at that seminary for two years, and then I entered the novitiate, which is a year of spiritual training because they were not diocesan priests, but a religious order. There's a, there's a difference there. Mm -hmm. And then I went to Catholic University in Washington, D.C. for the study of philosophy. Mm -hmm. The old uh, way of seminary training was you would study philosophy first and then theology. And uh, I was at Catholic University for two years, and after that I went to Immaculate Conception Seminary in Huntington, Long Island, for the Diocese of Long Island. And then I went to a traditional seminary in Switzerland. But when I entered the seminary in 1964, I was uh, a bit older than the other seminarians. I had been in the service. Uh, I had perhaps, uh, uh, or maybe a little bit more mature view of things. Uh, they were mostly 17 and 18, and I was uh, 22. And uh, I came, I found it difficult at first because I had been away from school for so long.
And eventually I came to, to love to study, and especially at Catholic University, study of philosophy, which was, for the most part, the traditional philosophy, where you learn about logic, how to think, and uh, the science of metaphysics, uh, which is the study of reality as it is. And it was a, f a good training. And uh, my disposition was always a kind of defend the hierarchy disposition because the tendency of liberal seminarians and professors was to undermine or at least to call into question the right of those in positions of authority to command us to do certain things. And I always sort of took the side of defending authority. That was my position. Well, when I was at Catholic University in Washington, D.C., and studying philosophy, as I said, uh, my studies were still fairly traditional. And I was not completely aware of what was going on in the School of Theology. I remember certain seminarians who were studying theology, they would come back to the house at night and they would say strange things about the gospel. For instance? For instance, uh, certain words are attributed to Christ in the gospel. And the modern theologians say Christ never spoke those words, which struck a wrong chord in me because no matter how people try to explain it away, if the gospel says Christ said it and he didn't say it, that's a lie. Even if uh, these theologians and so-called scripture scholars say it's kind of a development. Well, I didn't get the full burst of this new teaching until I started to study theology myself at Immaculate Conception Seminary in uh, Long Island. And it was in the course of my study of theology that I came face to face with what they were teaching. And what they were teaching was a radical new religion, a religion which was not only inimical to Catholicism, but which would be even uh, at odds with a kind of conservative or fundamentalist Protestantism. Hmm. It was a radical and dramatic departure from uh, Roman Catholic faith. And I found myself now in the strange position of being at odds with the ones who were teaching these things. You know, this uh, brings up an interesting point, Father, in that uh, uh, an event which certainly drew a great deal of media attention, the disciplining, if we may call it that, of the Reverend Charles Curran. Yes. And what I think it served, to, the, the point of this was, is does this man have the right to do research independently of Catholic positions and to come up with his own ideas which were at odds? Right. And the, the upshot of the whole thing was that this man is an anomaly. This is not the, the, the normal, the norm. In other words, most uh, seminaries, most Catholic universities are orthodox. They don't teach such things. Apparently what you're saying, and I believe the seminary you attended was one of the more conservative ones in the United States. It was a very conservative seminary by modern standards. Yes. So, in, in other words, <laughs> Father Curran is not the exception to the rule, but actually the rule. Would you say this is a, a fair assessment? I would say it is a fair assessment. And uh, indeed, some of the theologians of the new church protested uh, that Father Curran was singled out for this uh, slap on the wrist mm -hmm. because they said what he's teaching is being taught uh, virtually everywhere mm -hmm. and, uh, and it is true. See, so, yeah, because I, I can even recall from personal acquaintances telling me what they're being taught at so-called Catholic high schools, universities for instance. Uh, angels are a myth, Adam and Eve is just make-believe, Sure. Nothing wrong with artificial birth control, and so on and so forth. Uh, but at any rate, so you came to this point where you suddenly were at odds with uh, some of your theology professors. Then what? Well, not with some of them, with almost all of them. Uh, on, uh, on so many things, it became uh, a constant strife every day going into class and having to uh, to enter into these arguments with these priests because they were not simply saying things which were uh, slightly liberal they were saying things for example that Joseph may have been the natural father of Christ I had a professor of dogmatic theology Father Tyrrell was his name <laughs> 
an older priest, a very nice person, who taught theology for, I think, about 30 years. And here he is telling us that it's possible that Joseph might be the natural father of Christ. And his argumentation to defend this apostasy from Christianity, for that is what it is, was that we no longer accept the literal interpretation of Genesis. And since we don't have to accept that, we don't have to accept the literal interpretation of the first chapters of the Gospel of St. Luke. But other things, uh, for example, that there is no objective moral no uh, law. That, uh, Could you please explain exactly and precisely what do you mean by objective moral law? Well, why don't I just read a couple of direct quotations from my notes, which I put into a letter to the bishop of the diocese at the time, Bishop Kellenberg, who is now deceased. These are uh, direct quotations from my notes when I sat in class at Immaculate Conception Seminary in Huntington, New York. I'll, I'll read to you a series of these quotes so that you get some of the flavor of the type of uh, doctrinal and uh, moral orientation that prevails. Father Julian Miller, on March the 8th, 1971, quote, no universal law, no universal creed, no universal code of ethics. It is to a state embodying these characteristics that the Christian is called by Jesus, unquote. Again, same priest, there is never a fixed moral standard. This is the message of the gospel. Imagine that. Again, Christ did not know how victory would come. That is a denial of the divinity of Christ. Another priest, original sin is not something we get from the outside, but we get it when we sin personally. That's a denial of the transmission of original sin uh, down from Adam. Listen to this. The death of an infant is the movement from a lower level of animal existence to non-awareness. The same Father Miller. Jesus didn't necessarily see what would be the result of his death on the cross. It is not because he, that is Christ, died that we are saved, but because he entered into a new form of existence. Christ came to an awareness of himself as God the Son, which is a denial that he is God. If he didn't know he was God, he wasn't God. Death, judgment, heaven and hell are not future things, but are here and now. My former context was very much limited by my theological education. This is the same priest who said Joseph might be the natural father of Christ. He says, I am aware of having entered into a new dimension, a new dimension of a new religion. Another priest who was trained in Rome and who became the rector of the seminary after I left said, the communist revolution in China was one of the greatest revolutions of modern times. And finally, so as not to, to go on and on, uh, the professor of moral theology, my professor of moral theology, Father Regan, at the seminary said, when psychiatrists recommend extramarital sexual relations as a cure for impotency, this presents a problem. It seems to be morally out, but we have to think about it. I am open in this area and not closed to possibilities. Well, he seems like he'd, uh, he'd have a, an ally in Jimmy Swaggart there. <laughs> but the <laughs> Finally, the same Father Regan, professor of moral theology, here is an exchange between him and one of the seminarians. Father Regan, as for therapeutic abortion, there is a possible opening here to save the mother's life. Seminarian, Father, it seems to me that you are saying abortion is not intrinsically immoral. 
but that the morality of the act depends upon the person's motivation. Father Regan, yes, that's right. <laughs> well, that's... Now, when I wrote this letter to, Arch to Bishop Kellenberg of the Diocese of Rockville Center, I went through my notes, and I, I didn't study them. I went through and just picked out quotations, well, kind of at random. But the, the immediate objection I would see to this is, say someone is confronted with this, and they'll say, well, there have always been bad apples in the church, and there will always be bad apples in the church because the church as an institution is composed of human beings. What you seem to be indicating is this is the norm. How could you support this contention? This is a bad orchard. <laughs> the whole orchard is bad is what I'm saying. Right. And, uh, and the reason I say it is not simply to, uh, to, to launch into some attack, but to explain why for me it became very clear. Mm -hmm. I was subject to this constantly and continually, and this constant fighting. Uh, I remember one day I got into what amounted to a shouting match with a professor of dogmatic theology because he was insisting that Christ didn't die for our sins. And I had in my hand the text of the document of the Council of Trent and Redemption, and uh, I was quoting to him that uh, it was uh, in the shedding of our Lord's blood that atonement for sin was made. He refused to accept it. There's a priest teaching at a semi uh, seminary. So the reason I mention these things is that for me it became very clear. It was no longer a question of reading about these things, of someone saying, look how bad the seminaries are. I was there. This is what I was taught. This was the norm. And so by experience, you might say, the, the conviction came to me very, very clear. This is a new religion. And that's the early 70s, mind you, not the early 80s. This is the early 70s, and, yes. Well, what, what did you do at that time? That, then you went to Acon, Switzerland. I did, in 1971. What is the situation at that time with Acon? Was it completely accepted by, the, uh, by Rome? It was not under, Archbishop Lefebvre at that time wasn't under suspension. Is that correct? That's correct. It was established in the Diocese of Fribourg in Switzerland with the approval of the Bishop of Fribourg, who was a very fundamentally a good bishop who was what we might call a conservative. And by conservative, we mean someone who believes in the Catholic faith. Mm -hmm. uh, there's a problem with those terms. But he was in favor of the work, the notion of training priests in the traditional way. And so when I heard about that, Quite frankly, uh, when I went there, it was the most enormous relief to sit in a classroom with a professor who believed in the Catholic faith. Hmm. And what, uh, so eventually then, you finished your seminary training in 1974? 73. 73, and were ordained a priest at that time. That's right, April of 1973. What then, then you, you how should I say, began, be, began your apparent disobedience. You came back to the United States. I say apparent because that's what you, you know. Right. You, at any rate, you came back to the United States and you simply began entering various dioceses and establishing traditional Latin mass centers. Yes, that's correct. And the justification for doing it is the principle that the purpose of the laws of the church is the salvation of souls. Mm -hmm. The Catholic Church is not uh, uh, a dictatorial organization whose laws have no relation whatsoever to the moral law or to the norms established by God. Mm -hmm. The laws that the church makes must reflect the laws of God. Mm -hmm. uh, the laws of the church must promote the salvation of souls and the glory of God. Mm -hmm. Uh, it's kind of like our Lord, uh, when our Lord went into, uh, into the synagogue one day and he said, is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath? And uh, he knew that they made rules and regulations about it and they would condemn him and curse him for healing on the Sabbath. And then our Lord got up and he healed the cripple. Mm -hmm. And he was indeed condemned for it. That is what the new church is doing. The new church is invoking a pharisaical interpretation of law in order to prevent Catholic people from having access to the traditional faith and sacraments and mass. And they have a right to that. Catholics uh, have uh, an objective right to have the Catholic mass and to have Catholic doctrine and Catholic moral teaching. 
and they have the right and the duty to reject those who will not give it to them. Uh, one thing I'd like you to comment on, Father, uh, which perhaps will show the extent and enormity of the problem. Now, you were saying these things were being taught to you in the early 70s. Uh, one cannot help but, by reading the newspapers, come across scandals, in, horrible scandals, in current seminaries involving unnatural vice, unnatural behavior. Uh, one then is also confronted, in light of this, with the uh, recent pastoral by the bishops on the situation involving AIDS. In order that they consider using these evil devices as a lesser of two evils. What would you, uh, could you comment on this and put it into proper perspective and perhaps then uh, there'd be a more clarification of the situation? Well, uh, what usually happens is when you change the form of worship, you change the faith of the people. And when you change their faith, you change their morality. The same thing happened at the time of the Protestant Reformation in the 16th century. They first changed the mass, then they changed the doctrines of the people, and then they changed the morality of the people. And even some of the most famous reformers, including Luther himself, complained that as a result of the Reformation, the people were grossly immoral. So what has happened in these seminaries, uh, and what has happened among the clergy, is with the disintegration of Catholic worship and Catholic doctrine, there has come with it the disintegration of Catholic morality and what's called situation ethics, where they believe that basically what this priest said, there is no objective moral law. Well, right and wrong depends upon what you feel well, at a see, given time. The point is this. In the early 70s, this was done under the table, so to speak. And I think what this illustrates is, is that now, 16 years later, the bishops openly come up, come out with a, a horrible document, which in fact the Cardinal of New York said he would not promote in his yes. diocese. And there doesn't seem to be any uproar. I mean, this is certainly at least as bad, to my way of thinking, as what Charles Curran teaches, or what anyone else. Uh, what, what, to, what, how should this, uh, should this be sending a message to a Catholic who finds your activity alarming or disturbing? It should. It should convey uh, to the people the fact that what Charles Curran is doing, he is doing because of those bishops. See, Charles Curran is not just some strange uh, oddball who happens to have gone off on some tangent. Charles Curran is a new theologian. His ideas represent what is tolerable. And even when they come out and say that uh, he's bad for doing this, the fact that they just slap him on the wrist is uh, a clear signal to everyone else who wants to promote such ideas that the only thing they have to worry about is being slapped on the wrist. But he is a priest in good standing with faculties to, to preach, faculties to hear confession. In other words, they are in communion with Charles Curran. The bishops are in communion with him. He is in communion with them. And since they are in ecclesiastical communion and they are in doctrinal communion, then they are in moral communion. No. So it's, it's not surprising that the bishops actually believe that. What is perhaps a little surprising is that they have come uh, to to say it publicly, because uh, one of the reasons they have been so successful in uh, instituting the changes in the church is because they have been attributing the changes to the radicals. See, they are kind of like the brakes on what the radicals are doing. And now what they have done is they have themselves overtly become radicals in this dramatic departure from Catholic morality. Uh, many times, uh, Catholics who might have sympathy for what you're doing feel uneasy about attending your mass because they're warned by their clergy, their bishops, that you are not in communion with Rome, that you are not under the local bishop, and you do not have proper authorization to offer mass. So what would you say to these people? I would say they have to understand the difference between a mere local directive of a bishop, let's say, and the divine law. They have to understand uh, that there is a difference between what God commands and what the local bishop commands. If the local bishop commands what God commands, obey him. 
if the local bishop defies God and calls you into rebellion against God, then don't join that local bishop. That local bishop is like the Pharisees. The Pharisees criticize Christ because Christ disobeyed their human traditions, their customs, their practices. Mm. And that's all we're doing. We're saying uh, you, you must adhere to the faith, to the morals, and to true Catholic worship if you want to save your soul. If you want to go to hell with uh, those who counsel you to abandon the faith, you're free to do it. But don't think you have an obligation to do it. Hmm. For those who may wish to write to Father